in this series titled Legacy, and uh, we've been talking about leadership and your mantle of leadership and the influence God has given you and how um, all of you have a level of influence. At whatever season you're in, God has already put within you a, a, a level of influence and leadership. And so we've been going through First and Second Samuel. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Second Samuel chapter 15 today. And uh, we, we've been going through the story of the kings uh, of Israel. And so we started with Saul, and, and I give a recap every week because I think it's important. Uh, I, I joke about it, but I think it's important to understand the story. And to understand the full context of it, and some of you are like, Brent, I'm here every week. I've heard this recap. But, but you forget things. I forget things. I went to seminary. I've done all these things. And, and even as I dig into these stories, there's things that come alive uh, during different during, during seasons and different things. So I want to always go back and reiterate what has happened. And so we have Saul who becomes king. Israel rises up. They say, you know, they, they've, they've gone into the promised land. They're, they got Jerusalem. They say, we want a king to rule us. And God's like, this is a bad idea. Idea, and they do it anyway. And if you want to hear all about that, you can go back and listen to the other sermons. But Saul rules Israel for 30 to 40 years. And Saul was anointed by God. The prophet prayed over him. Um, but Saul became wicked. It said his heart, his heart became greedy. He became hungry for power. And, and he was ruled uh, by, by longing for power and wanting to live in a way where he could hold on to what he had. And so uh, he became more hungry for power than the will of the Lord, it said. And so God lifted his hand off of Saul and he anoints a young boy named David. And so David becomes the king. You know, David and Goliath chops his head off. He, you know, he becomes the hero of Israel. And, and David becomes the king and, and Saul. And we talked about this idea of like the transition of power and how Saul wanted to murder David. And David actually went on the run from Saul to stay alive until finally God anoints him and says, you, you are now the king, and, and Saul dies, and David steps in to his throne. And, and Israel lived in a period of prosperity and power, and they were ruling, and, and David is just like we talked about this last week. David is no different than you and I, because he, he saw temptation, and, and there was a part of him that wanted to lean into that. And so David and Bathsheba happen. He has an illegitimate child. He murders a man because when you're king, you can do those things, which ironically, I didn't talk about this last week, but, but what was one of the things God warned Israel? He said, the kings will take your wives and your daughters. And, and it's exactly, God is almost, he is being prophetic to what is about to happen over the next uh, many years with the kings. And so David takes a man, another man's wife, and murders him. Uh, kind of subtly, passive-aggressive murder, and uh, sends him to battle, and he dies. He's like, I didn't do it. They did it, <laughs> and he just sent him there. And, uh, and so we talked about David last week, and so we're in this story of this whole thing unfolding, and uh, God doesn't, doesn't lift his hand off David because it says David humbled himself before the Lord and confessed his sin, and the result, even out of such a horrible moment, is Solomon who is known as the wisest man to ever walk the earth, the wisest king ever, actually the Egyptians, world power. Uh, he, Solomon had two Egyptian wives because they wanted to sit, they wanted to be connected to his wisdom. And so Solomon, as a result, even out of such a horrible moment, there's a blessing and there's uh, a future king that comes out of it. And so we've been in this story, and, and, and I think it's interesting as we look at this, uh, and, and we continue on, we, we get through David's failure. And it says, uh, if, if you read your Bibles, David had eight wives, which, come on, David, what are you doing? Eight wives. Some of you are like, come on. No, like, I can't even manage one half the time. He had eight. And then he had ten concubines. So he had, he had, and Solomon was even worse. We're not even going to touch that one. But uh, he had all these wives, and they had different kids. Uh, Solomon was the, the son of Bathsheba, uh, and, and they also had the child that passed away. Um, but he had all these wives with all these kids. And if you get to, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but 2 Samuel chapter 13 uh, Absalom enter, enters the, the story. Absalom is one of David's sons, and he had a sister named Tamar. 
And so Absalom and his sister uh, are, are one of David's wives' kids, not the favorite ones, uh, because the Bible likes for dads to pick favorite kids because that always works out well. Um, and so uh, Solomon was David's favorite uh, because it was the, the son of Bathsheba. But he had these other ones, and Absalom and Tamar were one of the kids. But he also had another wife, and, and the son of that wife was Ammonon. And so uh, it says in the Bible that one day Ammonon caught, uh, saw Tamar in the temple and thought she was really beautiful. These are half siblings. This is going to be a great story. <laughs> they don't teach this part in kids' church. <laughs> It says that, 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 that Absalom, and this, this is in, important to understand the context of what we're in, in today. So this, this isn't, I'm not just doing this to make dramatic intro. Like this is important to the story. It says, it says, Ammonon saw Tamar and he thought she was beautiful and he decided to take it upon himself to get her. I'm going to put that nicely. And it said he slept with her. And uh, he, 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 he takes her unwillingly, and he sleeps with her, and Absalom is furious, like a good brother should be. And it says, it says in the Bible that Absalom goes to David, and he feels that Ammonon should be killed for what he did, and he's angry about it. And, and, and we're not quite sure why David's response is what it is, and I wonder uh, how much guilt he was still living in from the whole Bathsheba situation. But it says, uh, David takes compassion on Ammonon and doesn't kill him. And Absalom is furious. If you, if you ever feel like your family's dysfunctional, just read the Old Testament. It'll make you feel really good about your family. Like, you can read anybody in the Old Testament, any family. You can, you can read uh, about Jacob and Esau. You can read about David's kid. Like, it'll make you feel really, really good because you're hopefully not dealing with these issues. And it says Absalom is so filled with anger, and, and, and he's, he's mad because he feels like Ammonon should have been punished more severely. You ever been in that seat where you feel like the punishment didn't fit the crime? Uh, if, you, if you have siblings, I guarantee you've been there before. But uh, I remember in high school, up in the country, and uh, do they do sen senior pranks still? Is that like a thing? Uh, if you're in the country, it's a thing. And I remember the senior class ahead of me, uh, they did a senior prank where they broke into the high school, they smeared fish oil all over all the halls, they put dead fish in the vents. They let animals, because we're in the country, right? They let animals loose in the school. I mean, they shut down school for a day and a half just to get it cleaned up. It was epic. I mean, if you're an underclassman, you're like, free days home. But, like, it was, it was an epic senior prank. And, and I remember thinking, like, dude, they're going to drop the hammer on these guys. And, and, and I had a sister that was a year older than me. She was in this class. And, and I knew some of these people. And I knew the people that had did it. And I'm like, I'm not saying nothing. They're like, they're, they're trying to hunt it down. They're like, how did they get keys to the building? All this stuff. Well, come to find out, uh, I knew this, but the sheriff, because we had a sheriff where I lived, because it's, you know, you got two people, so you never got in trouble for anything. Like Sylvania, you light some leaves on fire and like the whole fire department shows up. I, where I grew up, like you could just light a whole barn on fire and no one would give a care because the fire department, they're all volunteers and uh, <laughs> what's going to happen? And so I, I found out that the sheriff, his son was one of the people. And, and it's interesting how when you have the right last name or you're connected to the right people, sometimes your punishment it, it isn't as severe as it probably should be. And I remember us laughing about it, and they let all the kids graduate and everything happened. But when I became a senior the next year, I mean, they had cops posted up at the school. They were like, if you do anything... You will not graduate. We will ruin your life. You will never go to college. You will amount to nothing. I mean, they were like, like, they made you terrified. We did not see your prank, which was a, man, I was sad because I like, I like pranks, right? Like, I like jokes. I like to scare people. I was like, I want in on this. And, uh, and, and, but they dropped the hammer on us. And I'm like, 
Are you kidding me? Like, they, they didn't even get in trouble. And I remember being so mad. And it's interesting, if you've ever been in that situation, how, how sometimes you will see people, or maybe, you have a, maybe you're a middle child, right? And you have younger siblings, and you're like, I didn't, I, I didn't get that treatment. You paid for their insurance until they got married. Like, they still have a gas card. They don't even live with you. Come on, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all got some, some wounds like me with some siblings, and you're like, you're like, you still buy them groceries. They're 42 years old. What are you doing? And it's okay. We can have a therapy session later. We'll, all get to, we'll start a connect group where we just sit in a, in a circle and, and cry about our younger siblings. And, uh, and, but, but, but it's interesting uh, what happens when, when you feel like someone doesn't receive the punishment or, or maybe they do something wrong. What, what begins to build up within you, the resentment that can form within you when you feel like the consequence didn't match their decisions. And this is where Absalom finds himself. And I want you to connect with this feeling because I think a lot of times we, we disconnect with these stories because we don't think they relate. But when you understand that you have that part of your heart, that bitterness that can come forward, all of a sudden you can begin to connect with these stories. And this is where Absalom is. He's mad with his father. He's like, you should, you should have killed him. He raped your daughter. He's furious. He's angry at his dad. And, and, and it's, it's interesting that, that, that David forgives him. And I don't know if his response is out of the guilt of his life decisions. And, and, and I've, been, I've been wrestling with a sermon on guilt. Because I think guilt sometimes clouds your decision making. And David forgives the son. And the whole time Absalom is getting angrier and angrier. And so the context of where we are today is you have a father climbing out of brokenness. He just lost a child because of his decisions. And now he has, a, he has, he has children that are sleeping. And he's climbing out of this brokenness and he's got kids across multiple wives and he's got a son that feels angry. It has all of the makings of a perfect Hallmark movie. It has all, maybe a Lifetime movie. That's too dark for Hallmark. <laughs> it has the makings of a Lifetime movie, and it's also the groundwork for our third type of leader. The title of my sermon is, Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Better. Anybody remember Annie? Is it Annie? Come on now. Some of y'all are singing the song in your head. And uh, I don't know what is up with the microphones today. But uh, anything you can do, I can do better. See, motivation is an interesting thing. And, and it's interesting in our lives. And motivation can either propel you forward. Motivation can be the thing to say, like, I'm going to do better, right? Like, I, I highlight a financial piece. And, and Noah, like, he was motivated. I'm, he's sitting up here. So if you sit in the front row, you get called out. That's how it goes. And uh, it's usually Scott. But, you know, I'm not calling him out today. But but, but Noah was motivated to say, I want to get my fine. Motivation can be a good thing. It can push you forward. It can help you get your life together. It can push you to a place you need to be. But unhealthy motivation can be the concrete that keeps you stuck in your dysfunction. Motivation is interesting because it can help you survive and push forward, but it can be the very thing that leads you to dysfunction and brokenness. I was meeting with a group of church planners. I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of a church planner. I'm, we're three years into this thing, um, and, and I've learned some things, and I've learned some things about myself, but I was meeting with some church planners, and it's interesting. Anyone who ever starts a third church thinks they're going to fix all the problems with the church. They're like, I'm, I'm I'm fixing everything, mega churches and bad pastors. And you go in with this like, I'm fixing all the problems of Christianity. Until you get into the church plan, you're like, I'm just trying to keep the, the lights on. Right? <laughs> like, I'm just trying to get people to show up when it snows on a Sunday morning. And, and you're in it. And, and, and I was speaking with them and I, was, and, I, and, I, and I was cautioning them to guard the motivation of their heart to start a church. Because I think far too often, maybe you're not a church planner, and maybe that's not, but maybe you're a business owner, or you want a house, or you want something. Guard the motivation of why 
you want what you want. Why do you want a bigger house? Why do you want a newer car? Why do you want to start a church? Why do you want to, why do, you want to do this or that? Why do you want children? And, and sometimes it can be good motivation. But sometimes we start things out of brokenness. And we start things out of poor motivation, and then we wonder why we're sitting in dysfunction at the end of the road. We're wondering why we're house poor, because we thought, like, I just got to climb this ladder as fast as I can. And then you have a house you can't pay for. And you're like, what, what, how did I get to this place? And so Absalom, in this story, we find him battling this motivation. And if you have your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 15, and, and this is such an important sermon, church, because we are all this person. We're all all of these people. And we find Absalom, and, and he's angry at his dad, remember. And in, and in verse 3, all of a sudden he begins to chatter because when we're broken, what is the first thing we do? We talk. When we're broken, we gossip. When we're broken and we mask it and say, well, I'm just sharing my feelings and I'm, I'm just cautioning what's going on. But, but really we're speaking out of this brokenness and, and Absalom begins to talk in chapter 15 and he's talking to all the people in Israel and he's angry and upset. And it says, it says Absalom begins to gather people around him. And it says Absalom would say, you've really got a strong case here. People would begin to come with him because they be broken people attract broken people, right? Like if it's so interesting, like just go on the Sylvania taxpayer page. Someone will be angry and then all of a sudden all the angry people come out. They're like, ah, burn the city down. And broken people, be, and so Absalom's having these meetings where he's getting all the angry people together. It's like uh, in Beauty and the Beast, right, where they're in Gaston's tavern. I've been, I have kids, and uh, and they're like, "Yeah, get the beast!" And they got their pitchforks and beer, and they're going crazy. And Absalom gets all their people together, and they begin to complain. And it says, Absalom says to them, "You've got a really strong case here." Catch the next line. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. It's too bad your king is so distant. It's too bad that your king doesn't care about your brokenness. Remember what Absalom's problem with his dad was, is that his dad didn't care about his anger, he felt like. So Absalom is projecting this onto everyone. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were the judge then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment and I would give them justice. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of us would have ever sat around and we're having conversation like, if I was doing this, it would be so much better. If I was, if, if I was leading this, if I was the one in charge, then, then there would be someone who cared about how you feel, Right? If I, if I was making the calls, we all think it's so easy. And, and Absalom's saying, if, if I were the he's planting seeds of rebellion. If there was just someone that would hear your cries, like me, right? Like, I would care about you. I would care about how you feel. And, and, and in verse 5, Absalom goes on, and it, and it said, all of a sudden the people began to try to bow before him because they, he sympathized with them. He connected with them. And so they begin to bow down, and it says, Absalom would not let them. Now listen, there's a difference between don't bow before me, I'm not the one in charge, and being deceptive in your heart. Absalom's heart wasn't, you shouldn't bow before me. My father is the king. He, he was playing to their emotions, right? Every, every few years, like, uh, you know, four years, we start seeing commercials on the TV. And it's interesting, every single person in those commercials on the TV all of a sudden cares about your needs, right? Like, I'm going to give you clean water. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to take care. We're going to be so great. And all of a sudden, everyone, this is Absalom, right? It's like a political commercial. He's like, he's like, don't bow before me. It says he wouldn't let him. Instead, he took them by the hand and he began to kiss them. You're like, that's weird. That was normal for them. 
Absalom is playing to their emotions. And in verse 6, Absalom did this with everyone who came to who? The king. They, they were coming to the king for judgment. Absalom was sitting outside the temple. Or if they made it in, he made sure to get a hold of everyone that didn't feel that they were done, dealt with rightly. And he says, come to me. I will make you feel good. Come to me, I will write it. And he said, everyone who came to the king for judgment, and it says he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Church, we got to be careful who we, who we get, for lack of a better term, get into bed with, right? Who we, who we sympathize with, because, because people will deceive your hearts, and they will draw you in, and you will think they only have good intentions for me. And the whole time, they're planting seeds of rebellion. And it says, Absalom steals the hearts of the people of Israel by swooning them, by sympathizing with them. See, in this story, Saul's weakness and, and poor leadership is marked by his hunger for power. We've talked about this. And then we have David, whose leadership is marked by his humility. Right? That's what makes David so great is that even in his failure, he's humble and he desires God. Even when he failed, he went to the temple and he worshiped. Even in his anger, he worshiped. He always had a humble heart. And if we have these two kings, one marked by power, one marked humility, we have Absalom whose reign is marked by arrogance. In church, we all have the heart of Absalom within us in some way or another. See, arrogance is the trickiest and most deceitful trait to catch in our hearts. It will deceive you. Absalom thought, I'm, everyone thought like, oh, he's just caring about us. And, and, and it would be easy for us to look at Absalom and say, he had every right to be angry at David. Look what happened to his sister. Most of us would get behind him and be like, he's standing for justice. He's standing up for what's right. But, but, but he's building a platform on arrogance. And, 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 and we would say, well, he's just standing up for his sister who is wronged. And what's interesting about Absalom is we find Absalom in his anger in the same place we find David in the cave. We talked about it a few weeks ago. Saul tries to kill David and he runs and he hides in a cave and he has a moment where he can murder Saul and he was justified in doing it. But what was the response of David? He said he came out and he bowed before his enemy. He said, it's not my, he is the king God has appointed. And Absalom is in the same position where he's mad at his dad. And instead of bowing, he rises up with a sword and he overthrows his father's throne. All out of arrogance. All out of this attitude that he can do better. That he, that he can lead better and he steals the hearts of Israel. Anybody remember the movie Bruce Almighty? I love Bruce Almighty. You're like, you shouldn't talk about that in church. But it's funny. And uh, you have Bruce, right? And he's, he, he's mad at God at the beginning of the movie. And he's like, you don't care about me. Right? And you got, you got Morgan, Morgan Freeman, you know. He does everything good. I wish he could narrate my life. <laughs> I wish we could overdub his voice with mine when I preach. Y'all would be so engaged. And, uh, and uh, we have Morgan Freeman. He's God, and he's mopping the room, working. And he's like, fine, you can do it better. Go for it. And we find Bruce, he's like, and, and he he's gets excited, right? He's like, look at all these things. He's, he's, he's abusing the power a little bit in the beginning. And uh, he's lassoing the moon, and he's doing all these things. And, and all of a sudden, he starts hearing these voices in his head. And it's all the people praying. And so he's like, I can take care of this. He does an auto reply. He grants all the wishes of everybody. He's like, you want to pray for this? Done. Check it off. And all of a sudden, the whole world goes into chaos in the movie. I, I love giving away movies in my sermons. If you haven't seen it, that movie came out like a thousand years ago, so I don't feel bad. And uh, <laughs> the whole world goes into chaos. And he has this moment where he falls before God in the movie. 
And he realizes that his arrogance thought he could do what God could do. He thought he could do it better. He thought he had, he could handle the power and that, that, that he knew more. And, and, and it's interesting, church, I think we, how often do we have that posture with God? Like if, God, if, why don't you care about me? Like you, I know better than you. It's the attitude of Mary and Martha when Lazarus dies. They, they yell at Jesus saying, why didn't you show up? And Jesus is like, get out of my face. <laughs> like, do you know who I am? <laughs> I know you know who I am, so you better watch out. <laughs> and, and I think how often we have this attitude of arrogance that, that I know better, I know more, and Absalom is sitting in this place saying, anything you can do, I can do it better, and I will care about people way more than you did. And so this broken, angry son uses this moment of his pain as a platform to overthrow his father's throne. Arrogance will creep into your heart, church. Arrogance will creep into your soul, and it will begin to tell you lies. It will begin to build things within you that God never intended. It will begin to build a platform that God did not intend you to sit in. And Absalom leans into the lies And he begins to justify it and convince himself it's a good thing. And Absalom is so blind, he thinks the rebellion that he is causing is not just needed, but it is justified. And nowhere in Scripture do we see a God of rebellion. Nowhere in Scripture do we see a God that, that is raising up this attitude Nowhere did anyone show up and call Absalom to do this. He began to speak the lies to himself. See, Absalom's motivation to lead, Absalom's motivation to become the king is is a point that that it is not given to him, but he takes it. His, His motivation to prove himself and to be in power It is not given, but it is taken, and it ultimately leads to his destruction. And it says, Absalom rises up, and he gains an army, and he goes into the the temple, into the chamber where the king is, and and they warn David he's coming with all of his men. And if you read 2 Samuel 15, it says, David gathers up, and he flees. And he even tells uh, one of the men who was a guest that was visiting from another country he says, go back. You, you don't need to be a part of our, they, they, won't, they won't punish you. Go back and live. And he says, no, that man is not the king. I will stay with you. And it says, David flees into the wilderness. The king of Israel finds himself living in caves once again. Finds himself living in the wilderness once again. A scenario that far too often in David's life he, he's sitting in. And it says Absalom for the next, if you read the next couple chapters in 2 Samuel, they're all centered around what? Absalom trying to hunt down his father and kill him. See, Absalom comes in and he takes the throne. And he's not anointed by a prophet He's not appointed by God. Remember, even Saul was appointed by God. Saul was even blessed by God. Absalom has none of these things, but out of rebellion, he takes the throne. And Absalom sits on the throne, and he thinks, I finally snatched the seat. I'm finally going to right the wrongs. I'm going to be a good king. He had convinced himself of these things, and his leadership is not marked by him fixing all of these problems. His leadership isn't marked by by all the things that he got right. Remember, he built his platform saying, I'm going to care for you. His entire reign of leadership is chasing down the father that he dethroned. And so he spends years chasing after David and not, not righting the wrongs, but broken. See, the interesting thing is what you are chasing what you are grabbing a hold of that God didn't give you in your life. What are you taking hold of? If you are chasing the wrong motivations, if you're building your platform on the wrong thing, you will chase it for the rest of your life. 
And you'll never have what God intended for you. Proverbs 16, 18, written by David's other son, right? The wise one. Some of y'all know it. He says, pride goes before destruction, but a haughty spirit before the fall. See, I think Solomon was watching this, and he was around this, and he was seeing what was happening. And, and Solomon was granted wisdom, but Solomon had also seen some things. He'd watched his dad on the run. And so when we read the Proverbs, it's funny, there's more Proverbs about pride than about money, than about anything else. Because there's a part of our souls that, that Solomon understood that desire for arrogance and power and pride. And, and, and Absalom is living in this way. And, and here's the thing, church, is we're living in a society today where we have a whole bunch of leaders and we have a whole bunch of people that have built their platform on arrogance. And some of you are sitting in this room saying, yeah, we do. They're so wrong and you're pointing the finger, and what's the phrase? You got three pointing right back at you. We are all this person. And we're living in a world where we love to point out everybody's arrogance, and we love to tear people down, and we love to say, like, I could do it better. And we're missing the point that God never called you to do it better. He called you to be right where you're at right now. God never called you to be the mayor of the city, right? He, he called you to be right where you're at. God didn't call you to be the superintendent of the school. He called you to be a parent that raises their kids right so you don't have to worry about the decisions that the superintendent's making. God, God called you to be right where you are and instead of pointing the finger and saying, I could do it better than them. I know more than they do. God's saying, sit where I've planted you and lean into my presence. Mark your life with humility. David is, isn't in the cave. He, he, it's interesting. Every time we find David in the wilderness, he's content right where the Lord has placed him. Why? Because he understood God's sovereignty. He understood God's position. And I think so often we don't understand the, de the destruction we are creating by building a platform in this way. See, leading out of brokenness and from a place of arro arrogance is like climbing a never-ending hill. There's never peace because the throne was seized from a place of rebellion. Anyone ever been on a stair climber? It's... The devil. It's the worst exercise piece of equipment ever made. Like it literally, hell will be on a stair climber 24-7, just dying. It, it just goes in a circle, right? The machine, it's, there's, at least when you're climbing real stairs, you know there's an end, right? Like when I get to the top, like I'll, I'll get, stair climber just rotates in a circle, right? And, and, and this, is what, this is what seizing leadership and influence out of rebellion is like. Is it's like you're on the never-ending stair climber, always trying to get to the place where you think you should be, and you're never getting there because your motivation is in the wrong place. And Absalom, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, we find out where it leads Absalom. In 2 Samuel 16 through 18, he's hunting down his father. And finally his father rises up and he, he has Joab and some, and some military men. And he says, this is enough. And so he sends his men to go fight Absalom and his army. But David's a good father. And he says, don't harm my son. He's broken. Man, David had the heart of God in this moment. And, and he says, don't harm my son. He's broken. Bring him to me. And so they go and they fight Absalom. And they go before him. And if you have your Bibles, uh, I'm, in, I'm in 2 Samuel 18. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. And it says, it says the armies are, are going forward. It says there was a great battle and 20,000 people were killed. That's a lot of people. And, and they're fighting and, and David's trying to get back his kingdom. The kingdom God gave him. And it says the battle is so big that Absalom tries to flee. He knows, he knows that it's over for him. 
And it says he rides off. And if you have your Bibles, 18, uh, chapter 9, it says, During the battle, Absalom happened to come upon son of David's men. He tried to escape on a mule. Not a very good animal to get away on, people. Not, not, very, not a good choice. Not, there's not a lot of wisdom there. It says he tries to escape on a mule, but as he rode beneath the thick branches of a great tree, his hair got caught in the tree, and the mule kept going and left him behind. This is a scene from Monty Python. The mule runs off, and he is dangling by his hair in the tree, and David's men are surrounding him. Hanging there. Probably in pain because your hair's caught in a tree. Knowing you've been captured. And Absalom finds himself in one of the most horrific slash comedic scenes in the Bible. Defenseless, hanging from a tree. See, his destruction comes upon him. In this battle, and I, and I think as he dangled there, his failure flashed before his eyes. I, I believe this. Because I know if I was dangling in this place, I'd be asking the question, how did I get here? How do you get to the place you're dangling, humiliated from a tree by your hair? See, Absalom was, a, the Bible says, a, the best looking man in Israel. He had flowing hair and he looked beautiful and now he finds himself by the very thing he gained his influence with, dangling from a tree. Hung out to dry. And as his life flashed before his eyes and he says, how do I get in this place? He, he begins to think, I was a son of the king. I was a prince. I was a brother. I sat in the palace and had everything. But then I got angry. And I was broken. And there was the rebellion and the throne and then the fighting. And now death by hanging in a tree by my hair. Church, this is what arrogance will do to you. If you don't catch it early on, if you don't catch it in your heart, if you don't expose what is, if you're not honest about what is already in there, arrogance will leave you in this place. It might be a figurative tree. Maybe it will be a real one. I've been in some weird situations where I'm like, how did I get in this place? I put myself here. Arrogance will leave you every time in this place. You will build a platform to prove everyone wrong or yourself right, and it's never enough. You will never be justified until you find yourself exposed, hanging in a tree at your bitter end. And this is where Absalom is in his life. And maybe today you're sitting here and you're like, well, that's not me. Like, I don't, I don't want power. I don't want a throne. But, but you still have the hunger. You still have that part of you that thinks you know more, that wants to prove something wrong, that wants to prove yourself right. I, I, I remember really early on in ministry, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm ADHD to the max. If you ever talk to me, I'm looking at 50,000 things because my brain just goes like that. I've learned to deal with it in my life, and, uh, but, but I, remember, I remember periods in my life, I remember in third grade, third grade, sitting with a guidance counselor, and they're like, you got to go into a trade. Like, you're never going to make it through school. I'm like, this is, what are you doing to me? So I convinced myself I was going to be a cop as a kid. I'm like, I'm going to be a cop. Like, that's what I have to do. I, am, I can't do anything else. I don't know why I wanted to be a cop. I think I saw RoboCop and thought they were cool. And, uh, and so, like, I, I remember teachers, and, 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 and it wasn't until high school that I found my stride, because in high school, you can begin to move at your own pace, right? And so, high school, I did awesome. And, and my older sister hated it, because I was in all of her math classes, and she'd be trying to cheat off me, and I'd be like, get behind me, Satan. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I was good in high school. I graduated good. But, but I remember, from, from a young age, I built this attitude that I want to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to be smarter than you think I am. And so even when I went off to college, I'm the first one in my family to go to college and graduate college. And, and you would think, wow, that's really cool. But, but it was all out of a place of arrogance. 
I wanted to prove everybody wrong. And, and I built my life on this platform that, that I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to know more. I'm going to do more. I'm not going to fail. And, and some of that's still there. Like if, if I've decided in my head something's going to happen, I'm not going to fail it. I'm, we're going through. We're going to figure it out. And uh, that can be very destructive on your life and your family sometimes. And so I went through college, and, 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 and then uh, I, I, when I started ministry, uh, I said, you know what, I want to be smarter than everyone. So I would read books all the time. And you're like, that's a good thing. Reading's good. I wish I would read more. But it was out of the wrong motivation. I thought if I could consume as much as I could, I'll be smarter than everyone above me. And I remember having this attitude as a young youth pastor that, man, if, if I was running the church... I would know, man, I wouldn't do it like that. You don't understand people. And I had this attitude that, that I knew more. And so I would read and I would read and people would be like, How, why you, like, you're just like, I would consume books. Like, and it was, a, it wasn't, I, I was learning things, but it was all a platform of my arrogance. And I'd put them on the wall and they'd be nice alphabet, anybody like alphabetical things? Come on, and you'd have them all like looking nice. I'm like, I only buy hard copy books because you look smarter. I want rich mahogany, you know. <laughs> and I began to build this platform of arrogance. I want to be smarter. And, and I went to a church in Maryland. I, I worked at a church. Both of my kids were born in Baltimore. Uh, I don't like the Ravens, but they were born there. And uh, I worked at a church, and they, sent, they actually sent me back to school, which fed my arrogance even more. They're like, we'll pay for you to go get your master's. I'm like, done. Make me smarter. And I was sitting with a, a lady. I actually messaged her over the weekend because I haven't, I've never told her this. But the, the children's director, a lady named Rena, one day, I would go into her office and I'd goof around and we'd chat. And uh, she, her kids were my age and uh, she was awesome. She was a great person. And, and, and one day she caught me doing something that I had never had anyone ever call me out before. I was sitting in her office and, and I was talking about what books I've read or I, and I was recommending books. And, and, and if I think back at it now, I didn't know it then, but I would look around and be like, you don't even have any books in here. You're not smart. And I remember her calling me out one day and being like, why do you always bring up what you're reading? Why do you always bring up or recommend and, and why are you always doing that? And I remember laughing it off in my arrogance of like, I, I, I was just curious, you know, I just want you to learn something, whatever. You're like, uh, let's learn together. And I left that and I didn't really think about it until years and years later. See, what had been developing within me, you'd think like, oh, he's a pastor. He wants to learn. He wants to know more. He wants to be smart. But what I had been feeding in my soul is the heart of Absalom. This heart that I, I want to know more. I want to be smarter. I want to, I want to tear you down. Like, you, you're not going to tell me I'm not good enough because I'm going to have read more. I'm going to be more educated. I'm going to know more because I want to defeat you. And I remember God dealing with me and the Holy Spirit convicting me of this, especially there's nothing more. Uh, I, start a church and the Lord will reveal all the broken parts of your heart. True story. And I remember as, as the Lord began to work in my life and, and as things began to change, the Lord began to deal with some of these things within me. Why do you want this? What are you trying to prove wrong? What are you trying to prove? Because if I've called you there, if my hand of favor is upon you, you have nothing to prove. And I remember sitting before the Lord. I've built my life around this attitude, around this, this platform of, of proving people wrong an unhealthy motivation. And I remember even thinking in my life, like I'm trying to climb this ladder and it feels like I'm never getting to the end. Because I was building my life on sand. And I look at Absalom and I look at his life and I look at the church. I look at our church. I look at the global church and I think the the the, the the world doesn't need any more Absaloms. Your children, your future children, don't need Absalom parents. Parents.
appearance? What are you trying to prove by filling your own cup? Leadership influence born out of this place is not out of the heart of God, but the heart of the evil one. If you remember Satan in the Old Testament, in the very beginning, he rises up against God with the heart of Absalom. He says, I can rule the universe better than you. I know more than you do. And it's crazy to think about if you read the Old Testament, it says it's Satan convinces the angels to get, you would think these are angels, these are like holy beings. But he, he, he convinces them with smooth talking and kissing them on the hand. He convinces them to rise up against God. And they're cast out of heaven. Why? Because of arrogance. Church, it's not a new problem. It's not, it's not. We are born to sin and we all have it within us. Within us, there's an arrogance within us. And so I asked the question this morning, what are you building your life on? What are you building your platform on? What is your motivation? If you're a parent, what's your motivation? If you're a business owner, what's your motivation? If you're just trying to be a normal human being, what's your motivation? Why are you at school? Why are you at the job? Why are you doing what you're doing? What is the desire of your heart? And I think it's something we all need to check ourselves with. What do you need to lay down? What do you need to give before the Lord? Because I'll tell you this, I don't, I don't want to be hanging in a tree by my hair exposed at the end of my life. At the defeating moment, it says Absalom hung there. And even though David, and, and this story can go on, but even as David said, don't bring my son back to me, it says Joab came forward out of anger and he took three daggers and he plunged them in to Absalom's heart and kills him hanging in that tree. Arrogance only leads to death. Rebellion only leads to death. We have to acknowledge we all have this part of us. But we have the ability to step out of it because of the cross. The cross redeems us. I, I love David because it's a symbol of the gospel. It says David mourns the death in 2 Samuel 18, verse 31, it says, David mourns and weeps for his lost son. You can be redeemed. You're not lost to your brokenness. You're not lost to your rebellion if we fall at the foot of the cross. So what do you need to lay down today at the cross? Let's pray. Heavenly Father. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for your grace. God, I thank you for the gospel. God, I thank you that you can redeem us. You can redeem our brokenness. God, you can take the parts of our heart that are rebellious and angry, and, and God, you can turn it to your good. God, you can forgive us. And so, God, I pray that this morning. God, I pray that we would lay down our rebellion and our anger and our arrogance. And we would take the heart of David, a heart of humility. And God, you would redeem us. God, I thank you for the gospel. God, I thank you for the work of the cross that pulls us out of this place. It makes us whole. In Jesus' name. Amen.